So what fundamental foundational technology do you need to have in place to actually go on your AI journey? I'm John Rose with Dell Technologies, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about, about that question. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, what problem you're trying to solve and how to prioritize and, and, and the big picture, which are very important. Remember, there's two questions. What are you trying to do and how are you going to do it? What are you trying to do? We've talked a lot about, and you should know what problem you're trying to solve. But when it comes to how you're going to do it, ultimately that manifests in a set of technology that you implement to do this stuff. It doesn't happen through magic. And, and trust me, you don't have the necessary technology in place today before AI to do AI stuff. There are new tools, new components. If you find yourself, for every use case you come up with, with the need to implement a standalone AI factory or AI technology or AI component to achieve that outcome, that one single outcome, you're doing it wrong. And the reason you're doing it wrong is that you're eventually going to have lots of AI outcomes. And if each of them requires some random SaaS tool or some random platform that only solves that one problem, you will eventually create chaos. We want to avoid that. And the way to avoid it, it turns out, comes from actually looking and mining the data about what problems you're trying to solve. And that may sound like a strange comment, but it turns out that I think everyone on this journey, when they start it, has a period of ideation. We added a Dell. We had like 800 projects that were proposed. And we didn't choose to do 800 projects. We've talked about it. We chose to do kind of four major areas and we were very disciplined, but we didn't throw away those projects. We have a list of like all the possible ideas that people have come up with. And one of the things that we found is it was very helpful to take a look at that list, put a couple of technologists on it, and just look at every single proposal and ask the following question. What fundamental AI technology do I need to accomplish that outcome, that particular use case? And if you do that 800 times, an interesting thing happens. You do not find that there are 800 unique ways to do AI. In fact, there are far fewer unique things that are needed to do AI, and patterns start to materialize. At Dell, when we did this, it turns out that there were five things that showed up. If you took your 800 use cases and asked and answered that question, what foundational AI technology could allow me to deliver that? you will find that it is not 800. It is probably five or six or three. And my recommendation, and a lot of people kind of throw away the 800 random ideas as they pick prioritization, is don't throw them away. It's good to know the art of the possible, and it's good to make sure that as you start to see this pattern, it tells you what you need to put in place for the long term. Because if you can solve for 800 things with like five components, you can probably solve for a thousand things or the next things. And you're building more of a foundational architecture that is not an opinion. It's based on actually being able to solve theoretically lots of problems. You may choose to only solve some of them, but at least the data has told you which problems are worth solving and which technologies are foundational to it. Well, everybody who's kind of got things into production has found that there are two kind of foundational Swiss Army knife tools that almost everybody ends up needing. And this is important because if you haven't done all this analysis and you even don't want to do it, you can take away from this that if you have the following problems I'm going to talk about, you probably will need a standardized rag-based chatbot and a coding assistant, and you could probably put that in production right now without working anything else out, and you'd probably be in a very safe position. Now, the reason these are important is, uh, and, the, and why they become so standardized is that, you know, the, the first big opportunity with generative AI was to take your proprietary data and emit it as a generative experience, a chatbot, a, uh, a, an assistant, integrate, uh, doing summarization, all kinds of tools. And all that was was this ability to convert data that existed somewhere into this generative experience. And it turns out that the tool that does that is a system that expresses itself as a chatbot interface or some kind of generative interface on the front end and at the back end uses something called retrieval augmented generation, which is a technique that came out about a year and a half ago that essentially allows you to vectorize your proprietary data so that an AI model can understand it and combine it and actually express it using a large language model, even though the large language model itself doesn't have your proprietary data inside of it. It's this combination of your proprietary data plus the large language model working together to express itself as a chatbot. Great tangible example is if you took like all your support information, vectorized it, and presented it through a rag-based chatbot, people could ask questions about your support information in a generative environment. You could literally talk to it like ChatGPT, but it would have the proprietary information about your product and your troubleshooting capability. That is a very repeatable pattern. People use it in sales experiences. I don't want my salespeople to go through a thousand different documents, take all your documents, vectorize them, put them in underneath the rag-based chatbot, and just talk to the chatbot, and suddenly they can navigate all the content in a generative experience. It just works. That one 
is kind of the Swiss Army knife. In fact, when we looked at our 800 projects, more than half of them just needed that one tool. They didn't need anything else. They just needed one tool that was a rag-based chatbot and we could accomplish that outcome. The second tool that's emerged though is coding assistance. And it's not for everybody. If you don't write software, you don't need a coding assistant. Turns out lots of companies write software. Today, we now have enough maturity in the coding assistance space. We have quite a large set of options of commercial products. You don't have to build them yourself. They're definitely things you can just buy and implement. And they have a profound impact on software development. Even the most rudimentary ones, if you implement them, could move 20, 30, 40% of your coding work into a machine. They can just make your code quality better. They can increase your velocity. And the more advanced ones are now adding other capabilities to really go after more of the full development pipeline. I would tell you that if you have a software development organization that isn't aggressively using coding assistance, you're already out of date. If you're using them, your development productivity will get significantly better, which means your costs will go down, your performance will go up, your backlog will drain faster, your products will be higher quality. It's just a no-brainer. Now, we didn't know that two years ago. We now know that. There's a pattern. There is no path for software development without coding assistance to beat software development with coding assistance. So it's, it's just a, a given. Now, the nice thing about those two, and the reason why I say they've kind of become table stakes, is not only that they're obviously needed, as you do the analysis, you find the, design, the requirement for them, but they're also incredibly easy to implement now. Um, as I mentioned before, both of them are now commercially available products. You don't have to build them yourself. You can buy them from a number of companies. In fact, Dell just recently made some announcements about packaging some of the rag-based chatbot architectures into, into appliances that you can just consume as a product. Um, the coding assistants we've worked with, uh, many of them, you know, just run on your infrastructure. You deploy GPU servers and a vector database and you buy a software package and you deploy it. In fact, when we deployed our coding assistant, it took us longer to select it than to implement it. It was, it's not that hard. And so anyway, punchline behind this discussion is two things. First, you will have to answer the question of how do you want to do all of the AI stuff you decide to do? And one of the conditions of that is to know what foundational technology you need to put in place. The best way to do that is not to guess, but to look for patterns, to look at all of the potential use cases, ask that question and answer it. What technology fundamentally do I need to do this task? And you will find inevitably that if you have 800 ideas, there are only a half a dozen actual technologies you need, and that will inform the roadmap of what you have to put in place to build your AI platform, to enable your AI factory. There will be variability, just like there is with Dell versus other companies on the longer list. But now after a year, a year to two years of doing this, we've found that at the front of the list, there are two that have emerged as almost table stakes and are actually quite obvious now. And both of them not only can be consumed as a product, but they can be run on-prem. They have very good economics. There's a lot of learnings around them. And there is an absolute demonstrated value for them. And it's likely for the duration of this AI cycle we're in, those are going to be foundational building blocks of every enterprise. So hopefully I'll help you kind of get started on answering the second question, which is, you know, how do you actually do this? And it turns out the data will lead you to the answer. And it's not as hard as you have 800 projects and you need 800 products. If you do it right, you could have an infinite number of projects. And you can do it on a very constrained set of foundational technologies, which means you have a platform, which is actually the desired outcome.